Hey guys, Jordan here. I just finished up an interview with Jonathan Corbett, a real estate photographer out of North Carolina. And a few things I got out of the interview. One, he is a $250,000 producer as a solo real estate photographer. He has also managed an 80% plus profit margin and he shares his journey transitioning to a team and the ups and downs that come along with that. I hope you get a lot of value out of this interview and enjoy. Hey guys, Jordan here with Real Estate Photography Hub and today I'm interviewing Jonathan Corbett, uh, a real estate photographer out of Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and joining me on this interview. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for uh, interviewing me. You caught me on a slow day, so this is excellent. Perfect. All right. So we're going to start off with some rapid fire questions just so that everybody can get to know you a little bit better as a real estate photographer. When did you start? I started when I was still in college. Um, so that's about 2012, 2013. Very good. And uh, do you do real estate photography part time or full time? Overtime. 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 Yeah. Lots of real estate photography. Um, and I even have a few employees now. Very good. So what's been your best year in real estate photography? I just submitted my taxes. Uh, last year was my best year. Uh, so we've been growing every year consistently. Awesome. And talk to us a little bit about those numbers. Um, so last year we made around $275,000 in revenue. Um, we've kind of been plateauing a little bit because I've been working on other projects and I'm not the type of guy who wants to make the biggest business I possibly can. I like to make it um, small, but super profitable. Right. And how long did it take you to transition from starting and part time to make it to full time? Um, I worked one year as a assistant for Jeff Amberg, who was a pretty famous commercial photographer. He shot for BMW for a number of years and that sort of thing. Um, and I never planned to go on my own when I was with him, but uh, learned a lot from him. And then when he, when I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, he said to find a job in sales for a few months, then come back to photography, which was one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. Um, but once I came back to photography full time, it probably took me in my first year, I made like $60,000. So, and that was way back in the day. Um, so, um, I don't know, I, I almost transitioned immediately. So it didn't take that long. Right, not too long. And how many customers do you service on a repeat basis? I would say on an average month, we service, that's a hard question because I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, we do about 12 or 1300 shoots a year, uh, usually averaging over 150 in the, in the high season and more, more like 70 in the low seasons. Um, but I would say 50 clients that are regulars, if I had to guess, Regular but I have to double check my, uh, my information on the clients. I have a lot of high, volume clients because that's who I target specifically. All right. And so how were you able to uh, get those customers? Like what? Sure. So um, a lot of people look for clients. I am a very much a numbers oriented kind of guy. I love trying to hack things if it's possible to do that. So that includes taxes, um, finding clients, um, social media algorithms and making sure I'm getting the most bang for my post, if you will. So one of the ways I figured out to get clients is by finding who are the top producers in your area, getting all the information for those people, and then targeting those individuals specifically. Because I know a lot of people out there will share advice like, hey, just show up to an office or um, search a hashtag on Instagram and start DMing random agents. Uh, that is, it's honorable to do it because you're doing legwork and that is part of the job, but it's a very stupid way to do business. Uh, and excuse me if I'm coming off, um, a little bit rude there. It's just factual. 
you want to work hard, but you also want to work smart. So when you have a regulated industry like real estate, where all the real estate brokers are required to sign up and somebody out there has all the information you need, you should look to get your inf your hands on that information so that you can uh, work with it. And you can do it 100% uh, legally. I'm not trying to do anything shady here. You just, all of it is in the MLS. You just need to get that information and then organize it, see who has the most listings in your area, and then make a kill list and start going after them. And that's what I've always done. Uh, and that's much better than just uh, targeting random real estate agents and your only qualifier is their real estate agent. The fact is most real estate agents don't have listings. That is a fact. And I do regular market analysis in my area. Um, there are sayings out there like 5% of agents do 95% of the business. My numbers in my market are around 8%. 8% of the agents do all of the listings. So 92% of the people you contact randomly aren't going to have a listing. So yeah, that's, that's how I get high volume uh, clients. So what are the tactics and the, the, what are the ways that like is say, okay, that's great. I want to target the high producers. Like, what does that look like to somebody that's just starting out? What, what are the tactics that you found that have been effective in picking up new clients? Sure. So once you get your hands on all the information, so just to give you an idea of um, what I do, I have a list of all the real estate agents in my area, what listings they've listed in the last quarter. Um, and then you can organize all that information into uh, number of frequency. So if there's an agent for all, if you have all the listings in the last quarter, you can organize them in an Excel spreadsheet according to the listing agent. And then if you organize them in according to frequency, you say, oh, look, this agent occurs 20 times this quarter. They have a lot of listings. Um, and then you can just organize the Excel spreadsheet into number one most frequent, number two most frequent, number three most frequent. Now, how do you contact those? I have actually found the most effective way, and it all depends on how you measure it. I like to measure all of my income per unit of energy. Now, man, I'm going to sound like a su super nerd here, but <laughs> um, if you pick up a, a phone and you start calling people, you're going to contact a certain a number of people per hour, right? Or I can write an email in 10 minutes and blast it out to all 4,000 agents in my area. And you play with the subject lines, you play with the content of the emails, and you start getting your numbers up in regards to who's opening up your emails, what type of click rates you're getting. You're finding out certain subject lines in the emails get a lot of clicks. Um, and there's lots of, there is so much bad information out there spread around in Facebook groups and everything else because people don't like emailing. It feels old fashioned, right? I get 40 to 50% open rates on my emails and incredible click rates. So every time I'm blasting out an email, if I need to, because frankly, I don't do it as often as I used to anymore because I got so much business. Um, every time I'm sending out an email, I'm getting four or five appointments. Can you do that another way with 10 minutes of your time? No, it can't be done. You could try to make an Instagram post. You can take 10 minutes to make that Instagram post or DMing people on Instagram. You're not going to get four or five appointments in 10 minutes. So uh, that is absolutely the most effective thing. The next thing I do that is most effective is regularly, consistently posting on social media. And that includes Reels, uh, Facebook posts. And I know a lot of people say that, but if you actually want to look at my Instagram, you can go to, uh, in my Facebook, it's Triad Real Estate Media. I'm legit. Just look look at Triad Real Estate Media. And you can see we post usually two to three times a day. Um, so that way I'm getting the direct hits on the emails, but also the long-term uh, long kind of like passive 
social media advertising with that. Also, people love getting exposure for their listings. And that's a great way to keep clients. It's just super great. Now, that is what I do every single day. If I have a slow day, I will pick up the phone. And I will say, if you're going to do um, one-on-one personal efforts, cold calling is the most effective. Um, DMing is okay, but and every everything that I do is based off of also that list. I have a kill list, and I'll keep contacting that person until they tell me no. Is that um, for like the most valuable real estate agents on your list, or the ones that do the most? Right. And when they tell me no, I just put them in our client relations manager to follow up with them again in three months. So are you finding that the the agents and agent groups that do more listings are a little bit harder to convert than like these these agents that don't do as much business? Uh, no, um, I think they're actually really easy to convert. And part of that is because when I worked in sales, I learned how to sell. Um, so that's why I was saying earlier when Jeff Ambrick said, put down photography for a few months and just go work as a salesman. I will say this, I hated those few months. I felt dirty. Um, there was a lot of horrible things that was going on. What were you selling? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I wasn't doing the dirty things. I was witnessing the dirty things, okay? And it taught me a lot about business ethics and what I want to be and what I do not want to be. I was selling cars at a uh, oh, tch, used car at a no, name brand <laughs> dealership. Like everything you can possibly imagine, like think of the worst possible thing a salesman could do at a car dealership. It's worse. Oh it's worse. God. Just to give you a short blurb, um, you know how you can get like service contracts when you buy a car, like, hey, we'll just add this to your monthly payment. You come in anytime you get your car service for free, right? Right. Well, we had a client. It wasn't, once again, I didn't do this. It was, we would have sales meetings every morning and they would tell, they would tell us this just flat out. It was in our training. Um, Someone asked one morning, hey, uh, so one of my clients came back yesterday. They want to cancel their service contract. Uh, but I couldn't find out. I couldn't find how to do that. Like in the employee handbook, like there's no instructions. Right, right, right. The sales manager looks him dead in the eye and says, depends. Do you want to make money? Then shred it. Wow. Okay. So that's and, not the type of thing I'm saying how I, want, I learned. Real right? or car salesman. That is awful rap. and crooked. Okay, that's why I hated working as salesman. That's why I'm never going to do it. But there are some things I did learn that are important. Um, for example, when you're going on a test drive with a customer, you ask them if they'd like to look at some numbers. Huh. That simple, okay? That's just an inquiry. Like, hey, would you like to get serious about this? Because as photographers, way too many times, you'll have people who like and follow your stuff, and they like all of your posts, they're supportive of you, but you're too afraid to approach them to actually close them, right? So you've got to get over that uncomfortable stuff just by learning a few scripts. Hey, do you like the car? Yeah, I think it's pretty nice. Well, when we get back to the dealership, would you like to sit down and look at some numbers? Translate that to um, real estate photography. Uh, DMing someone who who's followed you. Hey, I noticed you uh, follow all my photography, but you haven't booked us for a session. Are you sure you wouldn't want, like to give us a try one time? Mm. That's essential stuff that has earned me hundreds of thousands of dollars over my career. Uh, and before I worked at the salesman place uh, as a salesman versus after, I made a lot more money. I was just making a lot of mistakes because I was too shy. Right. But uh, anyway, what was the original question? No, I, well, I know we've we talked about like how you uh, get customers, right? And you mentioned several yeah. things that you can do, emailing, like return on energy. Can you give us a right. couple, just a couple tips? Because sometimes it's, it's hard to land in people's inboxes. Do you have any, any tips to help like 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you like how 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 do you stay out of the spam box and actually get lands and when you're uh, like cold emailing real estate sure. agents? So uh, some of the email campaign uh, software that you use will tell you all of that. So they'll say, hey, don't use too many emojis in your subject line. Uh, your email body has too many links. So make sure you try to compile mm -hmm. those down um, and they'll give you little ratings that, hey, you're looking spammy. Try to fix these specific things. So truthfully, I just do whatever the software tells me to do and it's worked out great. Um, Actually, another big point about social media versus emails, for example, one of the best thing about emails is that if you send someone an email, the odds that they will get it in their inbox is almost 100%. On social media, if you make a post, the odds that your followers will see it is less than 2%. Mm. Yet, people love posting on social media. If if you sent out emails and there was a 98% chance that your customer wouldn't receive your email, would you use email? Yeah, likely not. No. Then why do people use social media as much as they do? Yes, you can get a return it's the on it. Shiny, flashy it's a lot object. Harder. Yeah. It's a lot harder per unit of energy. Right. And uh, just for the nerds out there, what's your email tool of choice? I have used um, several. I like MailChimp the best. Yeah. Yeah. MailChimp, awesome. And it sounds like you're you're you have your business like very systematic. Like you're very, um, uh, you know, numbers. I mean, you've even mentioned nerdy stuff. But um, <laughs> you know, what are give us three tools that you use daily in your real estate photography business to support you and your team. All right, you're talking about software, like uh, running the business? Right, like software tools that you're like, okay. man, these are game changer. These are definitely great tools for real estate photographers. Um, a lot of people that I help out and stuff will constantly be trying to operate their business on free software. And I get if you're just getting started and you really have no revenue, zero, then... Um, trying to save money is important, but I find way too many people are too frugal at the beginning. If you can use a piece of software like Dropbox, just $10 a month, if you're a one man sh show, then that's going to be huge for you. But very quickly, that's not going to be enough because if you start getting more popular, people calling in and you constantly having to text people or call people, uh, hey, can I get the lockbox info? Hey, can I get the address? Uh, it's very hard to keep everything in line. So using either Aereo or um, HD Photo Hub is fantastic to use as um, just a business manager because people can book you anytime online. It automatically gets um, scheduled to your calendar. You can upload everything and it gets sent to them. So, I mean, still some real estate agents have trouble downloading just because they're computer illiterate. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have to chase down invoices or anything. Right. Hey, I'm just saying it like hey, it is. Hey, I, Some of the real I estate mean, agents out there who I'm are only laughing because the I've, greatest I've investment of your inquiries. lifetime are, can't work a computer. And that's a fact, uh, which, is a, which is a problem because they're getting the contract signed over the Internet, which they don't right. know how to use. But... Uh, yeah, so Aereo is huge. Other things that I use, go ahead and pay for an Adobe subscription. Use Lightroom, use Photoshop. Don't try to use free programs that cost you time. Like, you're looking to save time. Especially when you're starting out for those people, especially when you've got a business running, but it's harder to see how valuable your time is when you're just starting out. You should be marketing, trying to find new clients and close new clients. That is all the time you should be spending. Uh, the, the last thing I recommend is it is important to learn how to edit and understand photography and video inside and out. But because your time is best selling and closing, outsourcing is essential. Um, so, I know a lot of people feel like 
their specific editing style or shooting style is unique and it's the reason people use you the humbling truth of that is it's in fact not maybe two or three percent of your clients really care for you um, the rest of them just like your customer service or if you're cheap they like your prices right. um, so outsourcing will help you a whole lot so what are some tips that you have for uh, outsourcing your editing because i i i i am with you i think it's important for a business operator to understand uh the ins and outs of all the pieces of the business editing because i've talked to other real estate photographers and they're like uh they're, you kind of get yourself locked in if you don't know how to edit and maybe you're getting a bad yeah. experience with somebody how do you transition or when your customers are used to how they edit right so it's good right. to understand um so I think you, you're a specialist in, uh, I don't know, I'm delegating kind of, or, kind or of. I've just been doing this for a long time. So uh, also, because I did learn sales early, I uh, kind of understand how supply and demand works and all sorts of stuff. So I've pushed the envelope on a lot of different areas. In regards to outsourcing, um, yes, I outsource like 90% of my stuff. A lot of the video we still do because I just love editing videos. It's a passion of mine. Mm. Um, so I still want to run a business that I love. So I, I still do some of those things. That being said, um, before I talk about outsourcing, I want to emphasize again that it is. Oops, sorry. Did I mess something up there? No, you're good. No, okay. Um, I want to emphasize again before I talk about outsourcing that learning photography and video inside and out, including the editing is important because it's going to make you a better shooter, number one. But also when you go to outsource to certain people, you're going to know how long it takes to edit a video and you're going to know how long it should take to edit a photo. If you don't understand that going into negotiation, you're going to overpay for outsourcing, period. And that's what a lot of the industry has done. So coming home with this, you go into any real estate photography, Facebook group or discord and they'll ask you, Hey, I'm looking, or you'll ask, Hey, I'm looking for an editor. Let's say to do photos. How much does that cost? The immediate response is a dollar or more. Oh, per image. The only mm -hmm. reason it's a dollar is because it is a psychological number to Americans, but it does not translate overseas at all. I have done the math and I've even met with people who are, are, who are born overseas just to verify it firsthand saying, Hey, I've done these conversions online for livable wages in these different countries. If I pay, let's say $2,000 a month in outsourcing costs to one editor online tells me that I'm paying them, uh, a year and a half w worth of wages. Is that correct? And they'll say, oh yes, that's um, $2,000 a year in USD, uh, let's say by the Indian rupee, is a, is a great, uh, that's about, you know, that's very expensive. It's like, right. okay, so how much am I actually paying them a year? According to these calculations, I'm paying them around $1.2 million <laughs> a year USD. Is that correct? He's like, yes, that, that's that's actually correct. So it's not like this website is incorrect. It's that I'm paying them hecka amount of money. Yes, you are. I pay my editors 40 cents an image. And by my calculation, they're still getting paid the equivalent of $300,000 a year in American USD. And I have backed this up because uh, I know a business owner who was born in India, who lives here and still uh, uh, travels to India every summer. And he has confirmed this firsthand. The funny part about this is I posted about it in a Facebook group. What do you think the reaction would be? Wow, I don't know. Well, most people are probably overpaying for their editing, so that's crazy. Well, Where do you find people, these people? <laughs> people were furious. They, I, I thought that people would be like, wow, that's a really good point because if you just imagine you are paying a dollar for your outsourcing and it's costing you $20,000 a year to do that. If you're paying 40 cents an image instead, you'll be now paying $8,000 a year. 
So I just saved you $12,000 a year, which could help you hire your first assistant or your first hire for your business if you want. Right. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Huh. And I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit is just, um, especially when you're starting in your business or even at, at a bigger stage, I think it's important to use your resources appropriately, right? You only have so many resources, you only have so much revenue, you know, what are you trying to build and what can you accomplish with that pot of resources that you have, whether, you know, obviously big expense, if you have a team, you know, it's going to be wages, what are, what are those other expenses that you can control? And then, you know, what are you managing from a profitability standpoint? You know, as a brand new real estate photographer, this is critical to your long-term success because if you just start off and, oh my gosh, like 90% of your, if you don't manage it properly, it can really uh, make for a very unprofitable <laughs> business adventure or venture. Right. But that's something that you're, you're bringing up a lot and that you're, you know, uh, doing things efficiently, not uh, not trying to just go with what everybody else does, and and you know, save money because you you know you only have so much, you know, and then uh, you only have so much resources at your disposal, right? Yeah, I um, agree with you completely. Also, I mean, a lot of people just don't even operate off of a budget, right? So I'm not sure where they're pulling the numbers out of it's it's very much a feelings based like oh i feel like i'm doing pretty well or it's really interesting to see how someone's ego or attitude changes once they make six figures for the first time yeah um they really think they're i made it like the, yeah I'm just kidding. <laughs> but sad, sadly six figures doesn't take you very far uh especially when you have to pay taxes on that and if you aren't saving money and doing things like making sure you're paying your quarterly taxes. And if you have employees, you got to make sure that you're classifying them right as 1099s or W2s. And uh, that all scales the more you grow. Right. So if you're starting your business and you're not even paying attention to, okay, profit and loss. And man, so many people love to talk about how much revenue they make you ask people okay well how much of how much of that is profit that you actually take home crickets it's crickets mm -hmm. but uh anyway um when i was working alone and making a quarter million just on my own uh i had 87 percent profit margins wow um and that includes all the editing and um everything else so so let's back into that right now obviously a big part of the equation about how much money you're your business is generating as a real estate photography is going to be based on your pricing. So talk to us a little bit about like maybe what your business offers and how you uh, set pricing accordingly. And if you've had any issues, um, you know, having customers pay a certain price or not, or, you know, what did, what did that, sure. what does that look like? Um, I think the most important thing to talk about in regards to pricing is understanding that you care a lot more about your pricing than your customer does. A lot of people, when they get into um, real estate or any, any, any business, especially if they don't have business experience from someone else, so they're fresh, and a lot of photographers are, are very fresh, they're incredibly um, insecure about their pricing because they wrap up their value, like their, their personal self-worth as I'm a $200 photographer or I'm a thousand dollar photographer, or I don't pick up my camera for less than $3,000. There's all sorts of ego within that. Mm -hmm. And you've mm -hmm. got to understand that um, people are afraid to charge, even their, you know, they'll start out shooting free to, free to fee um, because they're afraid that if they charge, people can tell them no. And it's not just that their pricing's wrong, they take it personally, like no, you're not worth $200. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, so you have to understand that don't be afraid. And this is what sales, what sales was about, so important to me. Um, the customer doesn't care as much about the price as you do. The customer actually cares about, hey, um, can you deliver these tomorrow? Hey, are you available today? Because I have a last minute thing. Hey, um, 
my last photographers are really hard to get get a hold of. So just make sure you respond to them quickly. And if you're doing those things that really matter to them, uh, you can, they, they're not even to ask you about your prices. Right. Um, and that's why it's important to, to search for what the business world calls tells and your customers will tell you what's important to you. Now, a lot of people may come back at me and say, Jonathan, real estate agents are price shoppers. And it is true. Some people are price shoppers, but a lot of people aren't. How do you know the difference? They'll tell you that when they call you or when you interact with them through DMing, they'll tell you by asking them, asking you questions. So if their first question is, hey, how much, hey, I'm looking for a photographer, how much do you charge? They're a price shopper. But if they ask, hey, I'm looking for a photographer, are you available today? They just want someone who can they get a hold of because their time is limited and they don't want to be wasting their time calling photographers when they should be prospects, uh, pro Prospect, uh, prospecting, prospecting. I got you. I got new, you. <laughs> yeah. For new listings and closing deals. There's nothing a real estate agent wants to do more than close another deal. That is everything. So if you can help them close more deals, they don't care about your price. Um, so the number one thing is don't worry about your price. Uh, the next thing is don't base your prices off of other competitors. That may seem so ridiculous and it's, it's an okay strategy to start out from the beginning, but in all of my businesses, this includes my vacation rentals uh, and my real estate photography business, I do not base my prices off of my competitors. I base it off the 60 to 80% rule. Sorry, my uh, camera has a 30 okay. minute limit. Oh. Um, so the 60 to 80% rule is supply and demand. You look at your calendar, you have 24 hours in a day. How many of those hours in a day are you going to work? Usually, especially in the summer, you have longer hours, but in the winter, let's just say we're shooting from nine to four. So you have about seven hours of shooting hours a day. You want to try to book up all of your shooting time and you want every hour of those times, by the way, to not be spent editing. You want to spend it shooting. That's your goal, which is why you outsource and stuff. Um, once you get to 60 to 80% of your time booked, that is healthy. If you're below 60%, it may be indication that you're overcharging, but if you're just starting, you're not overcharging. Um, it means you need to market a lot more. You're, you're not doing enough posting, you're not doing enough emails, you're not doing enough cold calls. But if you get over 80%, that means you're not charging enough. You're in more, you're, you're more in demand than you have supply. So you either need to raise your prices and um, make your time more valuable, or you need to scale your business by creating more time. You add a second shooter, then suddenly you're not 90% booked anymore. You're 45% booked. Well, what happens when you're 45% booked? Well, you go back to marketing hardcore again until you get your calendar with all your shooters back in between 60 to 80%. And this is just basic business fundamentals that most photographers, eh, most business people just don't follow. And they follow bad advice like, oh, just look at your competition. And the reason this is so important is if you do good work and you've got a reputation, you can charge two to three times more than your competition and still be fully booked. If you're basing your prices off your competition, you'd never get there. Well, one thing that you brought up that I thought was very important is, um, is they're not, uh, most real estate agents don't price shop, but you mentioned a few things like, are you available when they need you? Can you turn around times fast? And that all just kind of stems back to uh, the customer experience, because as real estate photographers, a lot of times you think, oh, I'm a real estate photographer. I just go out and shoot proper or shoot properties, deliver them to my customers. But there's so many variables to that, right? That's only a small portion of your time is actually out there shooting, right? It's 
What's that experience look like when they're scheduling? What's that experience look like when you're delivering? Um, is it an easy file for them to upload to the MLS or are you sending them 20 megabyte each images that are going to take their internet, you know, an hour to upload? Like, what is that? that? That's just one variable, but there's so many touch points in your business that could either one, turn your customers off to never want to use you again, or two, refer their friends and family to your business, which in, you know, will just, uh, really, I mean, that's, that's something that I've experienced over time is if you really focus on the customer experience, uh, your customers will be turn into your number one sales force. Right. Yes. I, I, I agree with that completely. And oftentimes if I'm really looking to grow my business, I will, um, rather than offering free shoots, which is what a lot of people default to when they're trying to grow their business, offer new clients, free shoots, I will offer my current clients um, 100% of a referral's first invoice. Mm. So they tell an agent about me, that agent pays me for $500 worth of stuff. I give that $500 to the agent that referred them. That turns them into wild salesmen for me. Right, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, I completely agree with you there. Just hopefully they're not referring you some to their wife or something. I'm just getting some loopholes there. <laughs> hey, if it's if it's a returning business, and that's the beautiful part about it is, when you've got confidence and you've got experience and you deliver a good uh, product, when someone uses you once, it'll be like, oh my gosh, why didn't I use this guy years ago? Right. Um. So anyway. All right. So. Uh, Obviously, you you've been a successful solo real estate photographer, you're making 250k a year shooting solo. When and like when did you decide that it was appropriate for you to transition to a team? Sure, it has it had to do a lot with maturity. So um, I'm a kind of a competitive person. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but I always viewed. The reason I got into doing my own business is because I knew that I didn't work well with other people. Um, I, I started working at age 16 and I was just, I was always the type of employee like, Hold when on. you learn a let's, rule at let's work. Let's get a fun fact about um, Jonathan here. Uh, what was your first job? <laughs> I was a lifeguard. All right, there we go, lifeguard. All right. Yeah, first, first year I was a uh, lifeguard and teaching swimming lessons. And I've always, I've always loved teaching people. Uh, it's been a part of my uh, passion, but, um, uh, what was I talking about before that? Um, well, transitioning oh, to yeah. a team. Yeah. Yeah. Transitioning like, to a team. Um, and being the type of so person I, you like to work by yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just like working by myself. Um, it is a lot easier. And even though I have employees now and I've, and I've, um, been very careful about who I hire. I still miss the days that I worked alone. Mm. Uh, it's, it has some benefits, but I'm just more comfortable on my own. But as I aged and I realized, you know, I started having a little bit of back pain every once in a while at the end of the day. Um, usually I'd bend over for a shot to get that really cool angle. Then I'm like, eh. like <laughs> what happens this if I hurt myself? <laughs> I realized, okay, I'm, I'm turning 30. This was like years ago. Uh, this is going to be a lot worse when I'm 50. <laughs> I can't do this forever. So I need to have a business income that can rely on other people. Also, I wanted to have a family. And above everything else, I am a, want to be a good husband and a good father. So I know that if I'm trying to make a quarter million dollars a year being a real estate photographer, I can't do that and be home for dinner every night. Right. So just looking at the reality of um, physics and time space, I had to scale. Also, um, I was just in way too much demand for me to service all the clients. So uh, I started scaling. I waited a long time to hire my first person, hired a fantastic uh, employee who worked for me for two years. We agreed on the day he, 
he was hired. He would work for with him in two years and then move out of town to start his own company. And he did exactly that. And he's killing it currently in Colorado. Um, and yeah, that was the main reason was because I had way too much demand and I want, I'm thinking long term. Um, I'm also thinking another 20 years down the road, I want to have several offices across the state, not like a hundred of them, but like three or four and be able to present that as a sellable business to help cushion my retirement. All right. So you mentioned, uh, you know, as a solo real estate photographer making two, you know, a quarter million dollars a year, obviously that takes a lot of your time and my experience, like I was, you know, got, you, you get really busy, right? You said you're high in demand. How did you manage those tough days when you're like stacked up and you still had to turn around? Like what, what did those uh, days look like that you seem like you're super overwhelmed and, and how did you manage it? Honestly, when I was, one of the things I miss about working alone is how efficient I was because, um, if you have an hour to do something, you're going to take an hour to do it. If you need to get something done in 10 minutes, you get it done in 10 minutes. Right. Now there's a lot less pressure on me, which is great. That's nice. But I sleep in <clears throat> more than I used to. <laughs> uh, when I was on my own, uh, you know, I would listen to so much motivational content like, uh, I'd listen to Patrick Bed David with Valuetainment. I'd listen to Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, talking about how when he was um, still lifting and all of that, you know, how he'd wake up. And so if I needed to get a certain amount of stuff done in the day and there were not enough hours in the day to get done, I guess I'm waking up at 3.30. And uh, that's what I did. Um, it wasn't always that way, but I would regularly wake up at five. So I wake, woke up at five. I would be very strict with my editors because if, if I woke up at five and my, my photos were not in my download folder, ready to go, there was hell to pay. Like, um, I would, and this was also paying them 40 cents an image. So it's like, it's hey, they're like, getting well, you know, 20 you cents an much. image. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like it's just making sure everything is ready to go. So I'll download the images, have those. My goal was always to have those delivered by six um, because I would like, well, especially when I was growing, I, I liked all of my deliverables to be delivered before the agent woke up. Right. But that that, you, that was you, my goal. You brought up a good point about pressure. And I think, uh, you know, when you're out there and you know what you have to do for that day and maybe something didn't go right at a shoot, maybe you're running behind, maybe you didn't calculate drive time, maybe you have a limited time, it kind of forces you to kind of innovate on the fly, like, okay, how can I do this? I know there's been a couple of times where I might get a property, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got, this is a $3,000 or 3,000 square foot house and uh, I got literally 10 minutes to shoot it. How, right. how am I going to do this? How can I reduce the variables in the, this? So it just forces you to kind of think. So there's some positives to that on the innovation side of things. Maybe you're not going to shoot that way every single time, but you'll figure out a way. How can I get my camera to go faster? How can I do this to go fast? You know? Yeah, yeah that's, and that's what I call the front lines. Um, every time I talk about if people say, who are you? Why should I listen to you? It's like, well, I've been on, I've been on the front lines of the industry for a long time. Uh, like in World War II, when the Nazis were taking over the world, there were a lot of inventions being made to stop the Nazis because the pressure was there. And we don't invent as much when there's not that pressure. Right. As a photographer, you realize, you know, I, I can't shoot this in an hour. And then you start thinking, well, do I really need to have 60 video clips to do a one minute video? Right. I, I really only need like 24 shots. So let's get two shots at the front two shots at the back, um, one video clip of every room. And I think I could shoot that in 20 minutes. And after you do that, you get humbled a little bit. You're like, you know, um, I've been putting all of this extra work in that actually doesn't matter at all. And then you go through a huge growth um, experience right? Um, when you do that kind of thing. Um, so yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, previously or earlier in the interview, you mentioned, um, you know, being passionate about training. And, uh, you know, I think when you're a lifeguard and stuff like that, but currently you do offer, you do have some trainings and a mentorship program. So talk to us a little bit about those. Yeah, sure. So um, people probably never heard of it. And it's called Real Estate Photography Masterclass. It has over 200 tutorials on absolutely everything you can imagine. And um, it's an it's, an, it's a very extensive course The there's not too many people in it, though. Everyone who has joined has done really well. It's just that uh, I don't market it that much at all, because <sighs> marketing the course is very much a 100% sales thing. And I'm a photographer. I'm not a sales guy. I mean, you do have to learn sales in order to be a photographer. But I have learned that if I have to arm wrestle someone so that I can convince them to access this incredible information that's going to make them $100,000 easily a year, um, then I'm not going to try to arm wrestle them. Like, if you don't want it, that's fine. I would rather work with people who do. Um, so I also make enough money from the actual business of photography and uh, my vacation rentals, which I'm interested in. Um, and I'm actually closing another deal, hopefully, uh, in the next few months. Um, that I, I don't know, I've got everything that I want. I don't need to be the kind of guy who's like uh, Ty Lopez. Hey guys, uh, just inside my garage, just bought this Lamborghini. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to sell my soul so that I have an extra few dollars in the bank. Like, uh, I've got a little Subaru STI and a Datsun 240Z. Hey, I like your style, man. Yeah, and I'm a built, not bought kind of person. I don't want a nasty Lamborghini or Ferrari. I think those are for posers. So, nasty, uh, and also, bro. true car drivers hey, don't I, drive Ferraris. Yeah, um, See, art collectors. Real car drivers drive Nissans. You have the Datsun. I have a Nissan GTR. There we go. Oh, you do. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to talk R to you. R thirty five. There we go. See, real. Nah, not not too flashy. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Ty Lopez's. No. Lo long term, <laughs> I would love a GTR. A guilty pleasure, if I really wanted to blow some money, would be like a nine eleven GT three or Turbo S. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because uh, those are true. They're a little bit exotic, but they're still a driver's car. Yeah. I'm um, a big car guy, and I know this is a podcast about real estate photography, but I we could go on for days about cars. All the employees I have hired that have been um the better hires have been automotive photographers. Oh really? I think I think there's a huge link between interest in, uh, you know, just design, cars, and photography. If you're interested in, I've also noticed a, a connection with musicians. Hmm. If uh, you're a musician or if you're into cars, you'd probably do a really good job in real estate photography. Just Actually, saying, you should check it out. And now that now that you bring that up, I think you're right because we've hired several. There's been several uh, musicians, very musical people on our team currently and in the past um yeah not so much cars yeah. but yeah a lot of musical and create yeah creatives obviously yeah when i was in college i studied music not photography so uh yeah that was that um very good but to answer your question yes i have it you can go to realestatephotographymasterclass.com i'll definitely give you a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention but uh um, it's not something that I kind of like wear on my chest. Awesome. Like, so real estate photography, uh, masterclass.com. And then how do people find you on socials if they want to check out your, uh, your content? Uh, yeah. If you want to check that out, I've got a TikTok and Instagram and stuff. I think it's uh, real estate photography MC because real estate photography masterclass is too long. So I'm the rep MC. There we go. <laughs> and, uh, was it you? <laughs> no. Did, do you have a DJ job this weekend? No, no, I do not. <laughs> no. Uh, I thought it would be funny. You're the MC. Just absolutely ridiculous. Um, when I was marketing it more heavily, I thought, I wonder if I should do like a rap. And I'm like, yo, I'm the rep MC. But then I was like, no, nah, I'm white. That wouldn't go off well. Hey. I'd probably get canceled. So let's just uh, <laughs> not do that. I um, thought of some other crazy ideas, but uh, 
my employees um, talked me out of it, and it was probably for the better. So. Hey, it might help to go viral, you know what I mean? I was thinking about one thing that I thought would be really funny. Um, you, you know Austin Powers, there's a part in the movie where they're like at the end, and they're like, oh, thank you for all the wedding gifts. And there's uh, things that are like moving in front of their naked bodies so they're not actually oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I thought about how funny would it be to make a bogus OnlyFans ad on real estate <laughs> photography where you do the same thing. <laughs> where hey. you just casually in front of the camera talking about um, composition, three walls, two corners, yeah. <laughs> and you've got like a camera sitting in front of you with a really like 70 to 200 Hey, I think, that's, I think that's the key to selling more real estate photography courses. <laughs> that being said, I have self-respect and I'm not, <laughs> I have, I'm not that desperate. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm probably not going to do that. I think I'll still market what I'm actually planning on doing my next venture is probably, and I'm going to be really passionate about this. Um, I would like to find some historical property and do a YouTube channel on restoring that. Yeah. But um, yeah, if people want to learn, I'm going to teach them, but I'm not going to. You won't twist or wrestle else. them. Awesome. Well, we, yeah. we will definitely link to your courses and your handles in the descriptions or below yeah uh, but jonathan really appreciate you taking the time out of your day and joining me for this interview You've been uh, very insightful and a lot of great tips shared uh, for real estate photographers so really appreciate your time jonathan yeah no problem i appreciate watching your channel and uh thank you very much for having me on i i do enjoy meeting more people in the industry so um Look forward to learning more about you as well. Same here. Thanks, awesome. Jordan. Thanks, Jonathan.